So my name is Jonathan Whitaker. I am a staff software engineer at Okta and Auth0, uh, and I'm also a core maintainer of the OpenFGA project. Today I'm going to be talking with you all about federated identity and access management for Kubernetes with OpenFGA. And we will use Keycloak in this example as well to represent an identity provider uh, as we demonstrate this federation. So to kick things off, let's just start with some simple definitions. Um, it's often overlooked what is federation. So the Web Services, uh, Web Services Federation spec defines federation as the allowance of security principle identities and attributes to be shared across trust boundaries according to established policies. So what does that really mean, right? We have, we have this stack, we have infrastructure, we have applications, you know, we have identity providers. We have a lot of security context and it's spread across various applications and, and infrastructure in our ecosystem. And in order to ask, you know, access control decisions and to answer, you know, certain policies, we need to be able to share that context across these boundaries. And we need to be able to do so so that we can evaluate these policies across these different contexts. Now, in industry today, we have focused a lot in the last 10 to 15 years on identity federation and directory services. So some of the existing standards and protocols for the federation of identity specifically, these include things like OpenID Connect, uh, OAuth 2, SAML 2, and the Web Services Federation spec. I'm sure all of you are probably aware with some of these, um, you probably use them in your day-to-day -day job, right? Now, this is where we've largely been focused in the industry, again, over the last 10 to 15 years. We've been focused on the identity management piece of the identity and access management pie. And I would argue that as an industry, we have yet to cohesively stitch together the access management side of the identity access and access management puzzle. So I'd like to see more development, you know, as a community and as an industry in this space, stitching these two things together more cohesively. So I'm gonna pose a question to the community, to all of us today. What if identity and access management was actually identity and, you know, underscore the and part, access management? If only, we could, if only we could start to establish some standards or protocols, uh, maybe you know, APIs for enforcing access controls across trust boundaries, right? This federation that we're talking about. And I think that OpenFGA is a project which can really start to bridge this gap between you know, identity providers, applications, infrastructure, and in general, our whole stack. Authorization and access controls are everywhere. So if you're not familiar with OpenFGA, if you haven't heard about it before, I'll kind of give a quick overview of what it is. OpenFGA, FGA stands for Fine Grain Authorization. And OpenFGA is a flexible and performant authorization engine built to solve fine grain authorization. What do I mean by fine grain authorization? Well, Historically speaking, lots of applications implement ad hoc and custom access control policies. These are oftentimes implemented in code as database queries, you know, custom logic embedded in applications across your whole platform. You can't go to one person in your org and say, how does access control work across your whole platform? Because that's custom logic that only certain people know. OpenFGA was built to solve this problem, and it was in it's inspired by a system called Zanzibar that Google described in a white paper called Google Zanzibar. And in this paper, they described how they solved authorization at massive scale for all of Google services. Now, you can imagine how profound that is because Google is a huge company with lots of infrastructure, lots of applications. And those applications have their own unique authorization models, their own entities, their own access patterns. Right? So to build a system that's flexible enough to enforce authorization across the Google ecosystem, it's a pretty profound statement. That's why it's such a powerful model. OpenFGA was built from inspiration from that. It's currently a CNCF sandbox project, and we actually just submitted for incubation, I think, last week. So hopefully sometime this year we'll graduate from sandbox to incubation and continue our journey in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation ecosystem. 
Um, it's actively maintained today by Okta and Auth0. The project actually originally started um, in Auth0 Labs, which is an R&D division of uh, Auth0. And we have a growing community and various project integrations. So if you haven't joined the community and you need you know, to solve some complex authorization problems, please reach out, join the community, and, and find ways to get involved. As a developer using OpenFGA, I can kind of break down your interaction with our, with our platform, with our service, into three primary categories. As a developer, you first start by defining an FGA authorization model. The authorization model is a declarative policy that defines how authorization works in your application. So for example, you can say users can view folders and folders contain documents. That is the policy statement in plain English. And you can actually translate that to a declarative model in the FGA modeling language. We actually even have projects that have popped up in the community where you can take plain English and actually derive an actual FGA model from plain English too. So there's a lot of really cool integrations and features that the community is rallying on with OpenFGA. The second thing you do after you've defined a model is you write or you import relationship data. This is the data that governs access control decisions in your applications. These might be relationships. You know, for example, maybe, maybe a user has a role, or maybe, is, maybe a user has been shared access to a document. Um, depending on what kinds of model and policies your application defines, that will govern what kinds of data you write into OpenFGA. OpenFGA becomes an extension of your application databases specifically for permission data, and it's optimized to answer those permission questions. The third thing you do is then query OpenFGA, right? You ask OpenFGA for an authorization decision, and there's different kinds of queries that you can ask OpenFGA. For example, you can ask OpenFGA the very specific question, can this specific user perform this specific action on an individual object? We call that check, and it returns a permit or denied decision. We also have other kinds of queries that allow you to query authorization-related information in the inverse form. So you can say what resources or what objects can a user view, for example. And this returns kind of list-based semantics. So you know, what documents can user Lucas view? We provide these APIs and allow you to query these questions in diff from different angles. So let's focus in for a little bit on what an FGA model looks like and how, how OpenFGA in general kind of models uh, permissions. So FGA models are modeled as a graph. And you know, if you're familiar with graphs, you know that graphs are composed of nodes. And in, in FGA, we call these types and relations, which are analogous to edges in a graph. So in this example, we have two different kinds of nodes. We have user nodes and we have document nodes or types. And in particular, we have user Lucas and document secret. We can define relations which define relationships between related types. So in this example, the user type can be related to document types through read relations and through delete relations. Now, I use a dotted line in this diagram here because these relations represent possible relations in this graph of relationships. And when I use the term relation, you can think about that as just a permission, right? Read is a relation here, but that would be the thing that you're enforcing your permission check on, right? So it, there's a possibility that a user might be related to a document through a read relation or through a delete relation. Those don't become concrete in this graph of relationships, this graph of permissions, until you establish a relationship tuple. And this establishes a concrete path in the graph or an edge in the graph. And it's formally defined as a triplet where you have some source subject, a relation, and some destination object. So for example, if you were to write the tuple, user Lucas can read document secret, then that establishes this concrete edge in this graph of relationships represented by the solid line here. And that now becomes a permission in this graph-based model, right? We have other features of our modeling language too, which allow you to go beyond just basic relationship-based access control policies. We have what are called conditional relationship tuples. So these allow you to express complex policies involving you know, geo-based policies, IP addresses, IP ranges, temporal access, uh, quota, quota-based policies. Um, in this example, you can see that we've defined different kinds of entities in our FGA model. 
That's an example of an FGA model here. We have users and we have groups of users. And a, a group can, a user can be assigned as a member of a group. That's what these type restrictions in the brackets represent here. There's two cases that are represented in this model. You can assign a user to a group unconditionally. No condition is involved in that. But the other option is you can assign a user to a, to a member of a group with a condition on a temporal grant, for example. So this is an example of a temporal access policy where you can give a user access to a group or assign them to a group for a window of time. In this case, if the current timestamp is less than or equal to some grant time, the time at which you add the user to the group, plus some grant duration, then that user will be considered part of that group. If you're evaluating that relationship in a way such that that expression is not met or fulfilled, then we will consider that relationship as you know, not present in the graph, essentially. So with this mechanism, you can express very complex policies. And these expressions here that we've defined use Google's common expression language, which is an extremely powerful expression language allowing you to express a lot of different kinds of conditional expressions. Here's another example of an FGA model that we will kind of use throughout the rest of this presentation. In this case, we have users, we have role bindings, roles, and resources. This is kind of analogous to how you might implement role-based access control uh, with OpenFGA and this relational-based model. You have resources and you have actions that you can perform on a resource, such as get. Um, and anyone who is assigned to a particular role can get a specific resource. And you can assign people that have a particular role binding can be assigned to that role. And then you can assign individual users to a role binding. So you can bind a user to a role through a role binding and then grant access to a resource through that role. So let's take an example with Kubernetes role-based access control, which many of you might be familiar with. If we wanted to see if some user, Lucas, could you know, perform the get action or verb on resource pods, we can actually use that model that I just showed you in the previous slide. Here's how we can do that. We can first say anyone who, has the, anyone who is assigned the getter role can get resource pods. And anyone who has the, is, is part of the subjects that have the getter's role binding automatically has the getter role. And in this case, user Lucas is assigned to that role binding. So user Lucas has the getter's role binding, which gives them the getter's role, which therefore allows them to get resource pods. So by following the edges in this graph, we can implement role-based access control policies with this relational-based model. Uh, in this case, you see you know, user Lucas allowed is true because there was a path in this graph. We can extend that. So that was a very simple example, but you can imagine how that could be extended more generally to Kubernetes-based access control policies. So here is an example of two Kubernetes resources, RBAC resources, a cluster role and a cluster role binding. And I've color-coded this specifically so that you can kind of understand how this would map to this relational model. In this case, we have the cluster role called reconcile deployments allows get, list, and watch verbs on deployments in the apps API group. And it also allows the update verb for deployment status in the apps API group. On the right-hand side, we have, uh, yeah, on the right-hand side, we have the cluster role binding called deployment users. And user Lucas is bound to that reconciled deployments cluster role. So in this graph-based model, you can see user Lucas is assigned that cluster role binding deployment users. Anyone who's assigned to that cluster role binding can therefore, uh, you know, is, is a reconciler of deployments. And by being a reconciler of deployments, having that cluster role, you can list and watch and get and update these different resources in Kubernetes. So using this relational model, we can express very fine-grained access control um, beyond you know, just standard Kubernetes RBAC. We could even add more features that are not implemented in Kubernetes uh, access control policies today by leveraging and exploiting this graph-based relational model. On the identity side of things, let's pretend that you're using Keycloak as your identity provider. Now, this can also apply to any other you know, general identity provider. Maybe you're using Ping, maybe you're using Okta, Auth0, whatever it might be. You can manage users and groups from your identity provider side of the story. So in this case, there's been an awesome community contribution by Martin Buzozzi called Keycloak OpenFGA Event Publisher. 
It's an extension for Keycloak that listens to user group uh, changes or events, and it pushes relationship tuples right, into OpenFGA. So the idea is when a user is added to a group, we can write relationship tuples like this. The one on the bottom is the primary one that would be written by Keycloak today. It's just a direct user to group membership. User John is a member of the FGA group. But you can imagine in the future too, uh, OpenFGA can go beyond that. We can do nested groups and we can do hierarchies and complex relational structures. So we can say the FGA group, anyone who's a member of the FGA group is also a member of the engineering group. And user John is a member of the FGA group. So therefore user John is both a member of the FGA group and the engineering group. And we can you know, express this complex inheritance hierarchy by leveraging this relational model. So in the future, and this is a call out to the community and to key cloakers out there, maybe key cloak could use OpenFGA to natively store you know, group and user relationships and be able to get features such as these complex temporal policies, geo-based policies, and these nested group structures natively with that integration. We don't have that today, but that would be really cool, really powerful. So let's take a sample use case. Let's look at Kubernetes access management. We described earlier how we can map this model, but let's describe maybe how we can improve upon what we have today. So today developers can map OpenID Connect group claims to roles in Kubernetes. So the idea is you can authenticate against your Kubernetes cluster using OpenID Connect, and you know, your OIDC provider can return a token that embeds the groups that you're a part of in that you know, identity provider. So in this case, maybe you're part of the Kube admins group. On the Kubernetes side of the house, you can create a role binding where you say anyone who's part of the Kube admins group of that OIDC provided uh, you know, claim, uh, they can you know, read, read deployments in this case. Now this works great, it's really powerful, um, but it's static, right? It's, if you have different kinds of policies that you want to enforce in your identity um, mappings, for example, Maybe you want to add temporal access. Uh, maybe you want to revoke a user's uh, relation to, relationship to some group more dynamically. We can do better than this because in this scenario, the information is provided statically in the token. And so you would have to force a reauthentication event or somehow uh, you know, uh, revoke the token that's been previously crafted. So I think we can do better than this as a community long term. With that in mind, what I'm going to be demoing is kind of a proof of concept with Kubernetes federated access. And the idea here is we're going to use Keycloak as the OpenID Connect provider for Kubernetes authentication. So we'll authenticate against our Kubernetes cluster using Keycloak. Keycloak will manage the identity-based policies such as groups and group memberships that users have. And then we'll have a Kubernetes controller which reconciles RBAC policies that you are applying to your Kubernetes cluster and it will synchronize those, uh, this controller will synchronize those into OpenFGA in real time. So I we'll have a single centralized OpenFGA instance that has policy information and data being managed by two different parties, Keycloak, Kubernetes in this case. Kubernetes can then delegate authorization decisions to OpenFGA and those decisions will be influenced not only by the policies that are being governed by Kubernetes, the RBAC policies, but also the policies that are being managed by the identity provider, the user and group policies. And so the way we're going to do this is with a webhook, the webhook authorizer in Kubernetes. It's very powerful, very extendable. Here's an overview of what that architecture looks like, what I just described. So over here on the Kubernetes side of the house, we have our authorization webhook, and that calls out to OpenFGA and uses our various APIs that I described earlier. You can make authorization checks, you can look up resources that the user has, so you can use that for resource lists or collections and filtering. And then we also have this controller that watches for changes to policies in Kubernetes, our RBAC policies. And when changes happen in, our, you know, with our RBAC rules, we can write those into OpenFGA. In addition to that, Kubernetes is using OpenID Connect authentication with our identity providers. On the identity provider side of the house, you know, this could be any IDP that supports you know, OIDC, for example, as well as uh, a common standard for synchronizing information. And there's a standard out there called SKIM, outbound SKIM, which would allow us to synchronize user and group related information, maybe identity-based roles, and we could use that mechanism across any IDP that supports SKIM to push this information into OpenFGA. So 
that's the high level architecture. Now let's go ahead and jump into the demo. And we hope the demo gods bless us, right? So the first thing we'll do is we will bring up op an instance of OpenFGA. We're just gonna use Docker in this example. You can deploy OpenFGA as a service. We have a Helm chart. Um, you can deploy it as a sidecar model, and it's written in Go, so if you wanna integrate it into your Go app, you can actually integrate it natively as a library. So there we go, we have an instance of OpenFGA up and running. And I'm gonna run a little command here uh, which uses our CLI, the FGA CLI, we are gonna create a store called kubedemo. So what is a store? A store is, it's, it's a way for OpenFGA to scope relationship data, right? So when you create a store, all of the relationship tuple data, all the permission data that you're writing into OpenFGA will be scoped under that context. So you can use this for managing different environments. Maybe you have a store for a dev staging in a prod environment. Maybe you use a store to provide a, a tenant isolation mechanism. There's a lot of varieties you can use for stores. We'll go ahead and create that store. And I have a little helpful command here that I'm just using to set our webhook authorizer config to use that store ID. So you can kind of ignore that, but that's our store. We go over here to Postman, and we can look at the stores in our OpenFGA instance. You can see that we have this new store, has this identifier, and its name is kubedemo. We'll go ahead and re use the read API to read these relationship tuples that exist in this service. There are none yet. We haven't added any users to any groups on the key cloak side of the house. We haven't applied any RBAC policies to our Kubernetes cluster yet. So we wouldn't expect anything at this time. Let's go ahead and bootstrap uh, key cloak. So we'll bring up key cloak. And the key cloak import job here is just, it's just bootstrapping some resources. So we're creating a client application so that we can authenticate our Kubernetes, cluster, uh, Kubernetes CLI against a client app. And then we're also creating some groups and users uh, that we'll use in the demo. So let's go ahead and switch over here to key cloak. And we can log in with our just default credentials here. It's gonna warn me to change my password. You can see that we have a kube gatekeeper client application. That's what we will authenticate uh, our kube CLI against. And then we have a uh, john.whitaker at okta.com user here. That user is not part of any groups yet. And we do have this FGA backend group. So I'm a backend developer. Maybe I want access to a specific namespace in Kubernetes, for example. We'll go back over here and let's, uh, let's bring up our kube API server. I missed it, let's see here. There we go, we'll bring up the kube API server, which is called API in this case, the webhook authorizer, which is that OpenFGA controller and authorizer that, that Kubernetes is using, and then etcd, which we need to run kube API server. Okay, that's up and running, that's great. Down here in this terminal, um, and, and I should ask, can you guys see this okay? Is, you're good? Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm gonna bring up a terminal down here that just shows activity in our, in our reconciler and our uh, webhook authorizer. Like I mentioned, we don't have any tuple data here yet. So let's go ahead and let's apply an RBAC policy to our Kubernetes cluster. Here's an example manifest for some RBAC resources. We're gonna create a namespace called FGA backend, and in that namespace we will create a role called deployment reader that will allow the get and list verbs on deployments. And we'll create a role binding that gives the FGA, anyone who's a member of the FGA backend group, the ability to read deployments in that FGA backend namespace. So that's what our manifest looks like. We will go ahead over here and we will apply that manifest. And you can see we created those and you, saw, you might have noticed a lot of activity in this bottom terminal. That's our reconciler recognizing that there are changes uh, to our back policies in Kubernetes. And you can notice here that we see activity of writing those tuples to FGA. So if we go back over to Postman and we do a read, there's now a bunch of tuples in here. The ones that are kind of most notable to point out is this, this tuple here. It says that there is this K8's resource and it refers to deployments in this FGA backend namespace and anyone who's assigned the deployment reader role in that FGA backend namespace can perform that list 
operation, the list verb. Uh, I won't bore you, but there's no other tuples in this set that establish user to group relationships yet because we haven't added a user to a group in key cloak yet. So let's go back to the terminal. And we're going to act um, like we're a user, john.whitaker at octa.com, in our identity provider. So we're going to try to get deployments in that FGA backend namespace with this user. This is going to ask me to authenticate by following a redirect URL here. So I'm just going to open that up in an incognito browser so we get a fresh session and everything. And I'll log in with john.whitaker at octa.com. That's my password. We've authenticated now against our Kubernetes cluster. If we go back to our terminal, we can see that we got an unauthorized response from the Kube API server. This user with this ID cannot list the deployment resource in the FGA backend namespace. That was forbidden. So let's go back into our Kubernetes administration console, and we will go to users, go here, and we will add John to that FGA backend group. If we go back to our CLI now, and we run that same operation, notice we got a different response this time. Now, I, I haven't applied any deployment resources to the Kube API server, so we don't get any resources back, but we don't get a forbidden response. So this request has been authorized. So we just added, you know, we just changed a policy, if you will, a user group mapping in our identity provider, and we actually saw a policy enforcement change in our Kube API server, because it's all federated through this central authorization engine called OpenFGA, right? So we can go back. I'm going to remove this user from that group. And you know we can, we can come here and we can show it's forbidden again. I wanted to demonstrate something that we could do in the future if we have more native integrations in our CNCF ecosystem with OpenFGA. I mentioned earlier how we can model temporal access policies, you know, geo-based policies and IP-based policies. So I wanted to show what, what that could look like um, if, for example, Keycloak allowed you to say that I want to add a user to a group, but only for a certain window of time, right? Maybe only for 10 seconds or 30 seconds. Maybe it's a support engineer that needs access to uh, administer certain portions of your Kubernetes cluster. There's a lot of scenarios you could imagine here. This is the example that I wanted to just demonstrate. So we have this model here. Users can be related to groups. And those users can be conditionally related to groups with this temporal grant, which is a similar policy that I showed you all earlier. That temporal grant says that if the current time is less than or equal to the time that I granted that access to that group, plus some grant duration, right? if that current time is less than that, then we will consider that user to be part of that group. Otherwise, otherwise, otherwise we will not. So I'm going to simulate what that might look like, Keycloak would be writing that information into OpenFGA. Since Keycloak doesn't have that support today, I'm going to simulate that using the FGA CLI. So I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to grab this user's identifier. And I'm just going to put it right there, copy and paste this. And hopefully, I get my time conversion right. Speak up if you see something wrong. So it is the 21st, and we are plus one UTC. Um, so it's really 4, 4.51, right? So 16.51 here. And we will grant this access for maybe, let's say, 70 seconds, right? So we wrote that tuple. And if we go back here and we use this, notice they I didn't change anything over in Keycloak. I removed that user from that group in Keycloak, right? If we go back here, that user is not part of any group in Keycloak, but I'm simulating as though that user had been added in Keycloak with a temporal policy. Now, that, that policy, policy should expire at the top of the minute uh, plus 10 seconds. So, you know, hopefully here in 10 seconds or so, we should see that that access has been revoked. We got an authorized response prior, and now if I run that command one more time, I get a forbidden response. So we just enforce the temporal access-based policy, right? So you know, th that's, that's my demo. That's what I've got for you guys. And I just want to pose 
you know, the opportunity to you guys, the community. Uh, our team is only so large, and we need, we need help, you know, integrating OpenFGA into your applications so that you can enforce these kinds of complex policies, right? Like, you can imagine if Keycloak could have done that out of the box, I would have had to simulate it. That would have been really powerful and, and really cool. So getting back to kind of concluding thoughts, I believe that federating identity and access policies across systems is extremely plausible with OpenFGA. In fact, OpenFGA was exactly built for this. For the same reason Google built Zanzibar. They wanted to be able to enforce access control policies across every, every application in their whole company, right? Cross application, cross infrastructure access management. I believe that native integrations with OpenFGA offer unique features such as temporal access policies and other policies that you know, we mentioned earlier, and I'd like to see the community adding more of this native integration so that you can benefit from these things. I learned in this whole process, which was a really fun learning opportunity, that Kubernetes webhook authorization is extremely powerful and extensible, um, and it was quite easy to get that up and running pretty quickly, uh, and you know, I, I think it provides really powerful mechanism to extend it. Um, there's more work to be done on the OpenFGA authorizer, the webhook authorizer for Kubernetes. It, it doesn't have 100% uh, you know, fidelity with the existing access control policies and models that exist in Kubernetes. We need to continue extending that more. But you know, in theory, in the future, it could. Uh, and I just also want to say special thanks to some people from the community, in particular, uh, Lucas Kaltstrom. Uh, he helped on the Kubernetes side of the house. Uh, he was huge and instrumental in helping do the mapping and uh, you know, enforcing the access control policies from the Kubernetes side. And then Martin Bezozzi did the key cloak integration that you saw that synchronized the user and group information. So thank you very much for the hard work and help there. And uh, I'd love to see you know, more contributions like this from you guys on whatever cool projects you are all working on. So take the time for some questions if you have any. Yeah, and thank you. Hi, um, the actual graph, how does OpenFGA, how does OpenFGA secure that skim provisioning object or call, and then how does FGA actually secure the data that's stored in the graph? Yeah, so uh, the question is how does OpenFGA um, basically enforce access over, you know, who can write the data and how the data is enforced over the graph? Um, there's kind of two components to that. So the, the data itself is stored in OpenFGA as a flat triplet, just like I described. Um, and we actually apply an iterative graph traversal that's defined by the FGA model over that normalized triplet structure. Um, so that's kind of how the mechanics work there. There isn't necessarily any access controls directly over the storage data. Uh, you know, we store that um, scoped by store ID in, in the database. To answer your other question, though, you know, what we had was we had multiple parties. We had, we had Kubernetes and we had Keycloak managing different resources in a centralized store, OpenFGA. And so what we can do in the future, you know, I, I will say we don't have this yet, but we plan on adding uh, fine grain access control to FGA, ironically. FGA on FGA is what we call it. So the idea is that you could have certain, um, you know, service accounts or client applications that have the authority to write relationship tuples for certain object types. So Keycloak could be the authority that has the rights to write group and user relationships. And Kubernetes you know, is the authority that has the right to write and manage uh, those K8s resource, uh, resource types. So you know, we can enforce access controls of the data that's being written into the access control system uh, to the appropriate authorities. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, no, we, that, was, that was an example of, of uh, an integration that we could provide. Uh, we don't yet have, you know, OpenFGA itself doesn't provide the skim. That would be provided by like an external party, maybe an IDP, something like that. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Cool. 
Well, if you do, you know, I'll be around. Feel free to, to stop by and, and ask questions. Love to hear from you. Um, and as always, you know, check us out. We're on openfga.dev, and we have some other uh, community-facing repositories. We have a Helm chart, so if you're in the Kubernetes ecosystem, you can install us pretty quick. And uh, feel free to get involved and reach out on CNCF Slack, the OpenFGA channel. So thank you. Appreciate it.